In this example, we're going to cover cause-aesthetic elasticity with time-dependent prescribed fault slip. We will cover steps two and three of example subduction 2D. This is a vertical cross-section of a subduction zone, giving us a 2D model. It is based on the 2011 Tohoku earthquake. We have uh, oceanic cross subducting here. We'll refer to this top portion as the top of the slab. And then we also have the bottom of the slab. Uh, we have continental crust and mantle, and the slab ends in the middle of the mantle. We will create a domain that is 1,200 kilometers wide and 600 kilometers deep, centering the domain uh, in the x direction. And in the y direction, we will go from 0 down to 600 kilometers. We will solve the quasi-static elasticity on this vertical cross section. Step one covers just co-seismic slip on the subduction zone interface. We are going to skip that. It's similar to previous examples we've done with just co-seismic slip. We'll focus on steps two and three, which involve time-dependent deformation. In the case of step two, we have quasi-static inner seismic deformation with creep on the top and bottom of the slab, mimicking the slab subducting down with a lock patch uh, near the trench on the top of the slab. And then step three is combining that with uh, a couple earthquake ruptures to give a combination of prescribed slip and creep um, to cover multiple earthquake cycles. The concepts we're going to cover will be quasi-static simulations for elasticity. That includes having time stepping, time dependent uh, fault slip, we will be prescribing the earthquake rupture in 2D. We also have, uh, because we have the top and bottom of the slab, this involves multiple faults uh, in Pyleth, where we will have a combination of creep and multiple earthquakes on the top of the slab, and we will include elastic and viscoelastic bulk realities. As I showed in the first diagram, this is the uh, ge overall geometry. We have the ground surface. Shown here is flat, but it actually does have some topography and bathymetry in the ocean. We have a boundary on the west, boundary on the bottom, boundary on the east, and then our oceanic crust that is subducting here under the continental crust, and a mantle down here shown in yellow. We'll first create the final mesh in Gmesh, and then we'll create in qubit for uh, G mesh, we can, we will, in both cases, we'll be constructing points and connecting the points into curves and the curves into surfaces. G mesh, we involves, uh, the curves have directions, so we have to account for the directions um, of curves when we assemble them into surfaces. I've shown here in the orange points, the important points that we will be creating. Uh, there is also additional points uh, along the down dip uh, section of the slab, um, as well as the topography and dithymetry. But these are the main points that we'll be referring to in the Python script, also showing the curves that we'll be creating. Um, and uh, a thing to point out is that when we create, for example, the mantle, we will go in a counterclockwise direction, and we have to do all of the bounding curves uh, even including um, the slab, and then we'll have the continental crust will include the slab, the con sorry, the continental crust will include the screen portion over here, just the continental crust, the oceanic crust will include the slab going on the top and bottom uh, of those curves. So each, just another reminder, each curve in GMesh has a direction or orientation. The direction is from the starting point to the ending point, when you connect curves into surfaces, you must connect the curves in a consistent direction. We tend to connect the curves in a counterclockwise direction. If you want to reverse the direction of curve, you just use the negative tag, which is the integer value of the curve. So let's uh, move out of the slides and move into the uh, Python script. It's generate gmesh. It's in the example subduction 2D directory. One thing to note here is that we were going to do create this mesh within a georeferenced coordinate system. 
In this case, we're using a transverse Mercator projection, WGS84 horizontal datum, and we're going to use a local origin of 142 degrees longitude and 38 degrees latitude. Uh, these are the proj parameters here they will be using in this case. So when we refer to coordinates, uh, they are in this coordinate system, not just any Cartesian coordinate system. But for uh, GMesh, it doesn't know anything about geographic coordinate systems, so it just thinks this is a local uh, Cartesian coordinate system. Here we set uh, our parameters for the domain. We set the X coordinate of our west and east boundaries, the bottom, where at what depth is the moho or what elevation that's uh, 40 kilometers and we set a discretization along the fault and our bias that that's the rate at which the cells grow with uh, in size with distance from the fault so 1.07 five kilometer discretization along the fault we put in control points that we were extracted manually from google earth for our topography bathymetry. So we go our uh, X coordinate at the west boundary, the east boundary, and then points in between. So you see we have negative values corresponding to the, to the Y, um, except uh, here we have a few values, values close to the surface. Uh, scrolling down, uh, we give the, um, IDs for or the indices of you know what's at the west, what's at the trench, what's the east. So um, that's the length of the tuple points minus one. Index zero for the west trench is at index eight. Top of the slab points. These are in, again in uh, going to be all from minus two hundred forty kilometers up to the moho, and then up uh, to a depth of minus or a Y value of minus 7.5 kilometers. Indices for the slab top to west, uh, our co-seismic point, moho point, and the east point. And this goes back to our diagram in terms of picking off points. This is, I believe, the uh, point at which we switch between uh, co-seismic slip on the top portion. We create a, a split the curve there, and then also where is the point that's the top of the moho. Um, and then for the bottom, we need to add two additional points um, so that we can have the full section. That's the east boundary is also one um, down there at 175.6 kilometers. Um, for the Basically, for the bottom of the slab, we take the top of the slab and then just uh, do a vertical uh, translation. That's not necessarily the best way to do uh, a slab because it gives us it does not give us uniform thickness. It gives us variable thickness, um, but it's very easy to do. And, and so that's why we do it in this example. We're going to do uh, triangular cells. So we set up our default file name, uh, specify that we're just going to use triangular cells. And this is helps um, because we when we have the mesh coming up the top of the slab at the trench, we have very fine discretization of uh, and sort of a small angle. So that's best described in a triangle. If you try and do a quadrilateral, it gets quite distorted. So in this case, just a triangular mesh is the best. So uh, down here in create geometry, as we've done in our other cases, we are going to create the geometry. This one's a little more complicated because we have our points for topography. We just loop over those points, add them in, and then we create a spline from those points, and then we extract uh, the IDs or the tags of the points um, for the point that's at the west end, east end, and the top of the trench because we need to refer to those later. Uh, for the top of the slab, we're actually going to use a, a B spline so it's a little smoother. We read in the, we take those, loop over those points, add them uh, to the to G mesh. And then uh, we create the spline that's all the points on the top of the slab plus the point that's at the trench. Uh, that was on the um, topography bathymetry uh, spline surface. Then we're going to save the points at the west end, east end, the co-seismic point, top of the boho. 
when we refer to those later. The bottom of the slab, we take the slab uh, top points, and then we, as you can see here, our offset is 120. So I, I believe that's it. You can see it's in the X direction. So we just shift everything, translate it to the right. Uh, and so we just take those points. Um, we only need the first eight points and uh, we add the points using the coordinates, create uh, additional points that we need to add to extend the bottom of the slab over onto the oceanic crust. And then we create our V-spline from that array of points, saving the points that are uh, particularly the first one and last one. That's the west end and the east end of the bottom of the slab. Um, and we also need to add up, uh, so we have the top of the slab, the bottom of the slab, then we need to add in sort of the end of the point or the end of the points occur for the end of the slab. That's, we're gonna use a polyline just between the points on the west of the top of the slab, the west at the bottom of the slab. Then we can create the, the top of the mantle. That's our Moho West. We just add those points. It's a line, two points. And then we add the rest of the points of the domain. So on the West and bottom, we create all of those points using polyline. We could have used line as well. And uh, in some cases we have multiple points that are along a line, so that's why we need polyline. In those cases where we have two points, we could just use add line. They're sent to the same thing. Now, point here is that uh, we are going to split the curves. So we've created the spline that gives us nice uh, C1 continuity of the curve, and then we split it. If we were to create separate spline, we wouldn't have continuity in the slope. And so uh, it's best to create the full curve and then split it where we need to. That gives us um, our curve for the, uh, when we split it, it returns which curves we get back. And so we save those curves. One is the west one, one is the east one. Uh, we had to visually identify which those were. Again, split the curves for the top of the slab. Uh, we split the curves on the west boundary, split the curves on the east boundary when we had multiple, um, you know, points on our line. Uh, we want to split those up because we're going to create finer uh, specification of the discretization as well as uh, the boundary conditions. So now uh, you know, I'll flip back to our diagram. So what we've done is we we created, when we created the east boundary, we had all the, these points and then we split it up here at the top, uh, sorry, bottom of the slab, the east point did the same thing for the west boundary. We split our top of the slab at the, at, at these additional points um, and, the, and the bottom of the slab was continuous. So that's what we were doing to give us so that we can specify, for example, the co-seismic slip just along this portion from the top of the trench down to the co-seismic portion. Um, and it also gives, uh, we need to uh, split it here at the uh, Moho point because we want to create a curve and uh, for our mantle that ends here. So we have this intersection so we can uh, split the material properties uh, appropriately. So then when we create our curve loops, we need to go all around the boundaries where we need to reverse the direction. We use a minus sign. So we do a curve loop for the continental crust here, where we start west of the crust, continental moho, slab top of the crust, and then the topo west, reversing that direction. Uh, we do a curve loop for the oceanic crust. Uh, this one involves going around the, the all of the slab. And so we have a bunch of points here when we have broken it, those curves up into pieces. And then we do the same thing for the mantle. Um, a lot of pieces for the mantle. And 
but this is a result of breaking up those curves into pieces, as well as having multiple boundaries in the continental crust and the oceanic crust. So going over those, we go in a consistent direction counterclockwise. Finally, we synchronize. That brings in our points into our model so that then we can mark them and use them in our mesh. Uh, this marking them is very similar to what we have in all of our other examples. So we have three materials, the continental crust, oceanic crust, mantle. We create the physical groups. For our vertex groups, we have a bunch of different groups. We have the ground surface, our boundaries, some with and without the mantle. Uh, and this is because we're going to apply uh, when we we want the mantle to be able to, or we want the slab to be able to move away from the boundary. So we don't want to pin it, uh, fix it to the boundary. So we have some that include the crust, some that include the mantle. Um, and then we have for the top of the slab, we have just the co-sizing portion and the, and the buried edge for it. We have the slab top, the full slab top and its edge and the slab bottom and its edge. So uh, marking boundaries, uh, when we have more uh, curves to deal with, we have sort of more marking, but it's, the process is essentially the same. And the names for all of our entities match what we did up here uh, when we created the geometry. So all these names get reused below when we tag those curves. So that's why a diagram is extremely helpful helps us manage all of that information. When we generate the mesh, we're just gonna do distance from the top of the slab. So we create a fault distance field using the curves that are on, on the, the top of the slab. So the slab top and the mantle, slab top and the crust. Compute the distance, set the, use the our formula to set the cell size of the, starting with, uh, dx fault, that's our minimum uh, discretization size on the fault, and then our bias, it's the rate at which the cells increase in size with distance on the fault. Set that as our background field and generate the mesh. So a little more complicated than we've had before, uh, but still relatively straightforward. We'll bring up a terminal here so that we can run this example. Uh, generating the mesh. So G mesh, we'll do a generate, put it in the, oops, remove the E. No, oops, I'm sorry, we don't run GMesh, we run generate GMesh. Generate GUI. There we go. So here's our mesh. You can see how it uh, discretization size increases distance. And we'll look at our curves. Over here, we can see our hierarchy. So here's material one, that's the continental crust. Material two, oceanic crust. Material three, the mantle. Get everything back. We have our ground surface and our boundary west. There it is over on the west. Boundary east on the crust, that's just this top portion over here. Boundary east mantle, that's the bottom portion. Boundary on the bottom. Fault coast seismic, that's just this top portion. All the fault slab top is that whole bottom. And the bottom of the slab, so the full extent of the bottom of the slab. And boundaries, and that was a temporary piece over there. Um, and then we have the points. So we generated our mesh. Uh, let's get all of our points back. 
So here is our mesh. Notice we have fine discretization up at the top of the slab, and then we increase at a rate of 7% increase in each element size as we go away from there. So this is our G mesh mesh. Now let's cover meshing the geometry with qubit. So with qubit, we again construct our mesh with points, connect the points into curves and the curves into surfaces. We don't have directions for our curves, so we don't have to worry about those. We will name our curves and then split things. And so the way qubit does that is it'll create, when we have like a curve east, then when we split it, we'll get curve east and curve east at A. Same thing on the west side, that our bottom of the slab gets split into several pieces. So we have slab bottom, slab uh, bottom B, slab bottom D. On the top, we have A and D. Top, we have A, C topo, C topo at A, C topo at B. Um, and you can see those uh, within the qubit interface. Uh, when we connect our curves, you must connect nerves in consistent direction, the same as GMesh. Uh, we tend to connect the curves in a counterclockwise direction, the same as GMesh, but we don't have to worry about the individual direction of the curves. Uh, this is what the mesh looks like uh, in qubit, and so we will load that up. We'll first look at the mesh. So here's our qubit mesh. We're now using a Python script, not a journal file. Uh, we have a function here set up qubit that if you are running externally, it detects whether qubit is running um, internally or not and it initializes it if you're running externally. But here we'll just sort of um, won't worry about that because we'll be running it within qubit. For our uh, parameters, we move that out of the way. We have, um, we define what a kilometer is and because we do everything in SI units and discretization size, same thing as what we had in GMesh, five kilometers. We are going to increase uh, our cell size, 7% larger for every cell. So our total bias is 1.07. Cell type is try. We uh, set up qubit, import math. Uh, here we're going to um, use just, uh, we hardwire in the coordinates of the points. A better approach would be to put these in an external file, read them in. Um, when we converted from the journal files to just regular files, we did it this way. Um, you can see we basically do the same thing we did in GMesh, create our points, saving important ones like the end at the west, the point at the end, west end, to the trench, the east end. Uh, similar to what we did in GMesh, we split the curve. And um, then we get the ID of the last point because we're going to need it. We, and we name it or uh, sorry, get the idea of the last curve that was created and name it. That's what we're doing there. Again, for the uh, top of the slab, we use the points from slab 1.0. That's a little bit outdated, but that's what we had when we created uh, this example. And very similar to what we had before, we're saving specific points like the co-seismic point, the point that intersects the moho and the slab top. We again, create the, a spline curve, get the, uh, get what that ID is and then name it. And here we create uh, vertices by moving them to the, translating to the right. In GMesh, we just looped over the points and uh, used, uh, up, used an offset when we created points. Here we're actually just copying the points and moving them. Uh, it's a little bit easier, uh, but essentially the same approach. We create our additional vertices, create a spline, 
from those vertices, get the ID of the last curve, name it, create the bottom of the slab, create the top of the mantle that's at a uniform depth of minus 40 kilometers. We again, we create the curve, get the ID, so continental moho, create our lateral edges and boundary. In this case, we just put them in the splines, even though they're straight lines, uh, works just as well. We name those curves. And then uh, again, we're gonna split the curves uh, where in this case, we split a curve where it crosses another curve. So this is a slightly different than what we in GMesh where we identified the vertex. This makes it very easy. Uh, we don't have to save where those points were that we needed to make the split. We can just uh, use the names we've given and split a curves where curves are intersecting. Then we create a surface from the curves name the surface, um, and then we do an imprint. We delete all our extra vertices, imprint all, merge all, um, stitch everything together, um, and then we do some final splitting of the fault surfaces to um, so that we can uh, create our discretization size portion. Then we generate our meshing scheme, tri-mesh, to do a triangular mesh. Set the, um, in this case, we set the discretization size along the top of the slab using, uh, set using the curve, setting the size. Then we use the skeleton sizing uh, as we've done in some of our other examples. This just gradually grows the mesh with a gradient from uh, where we set the minimum size to be um, the uh, size on the faults. And there's our gradient, that's our bias value. Mesh the surface all, we use condition number smoothing. And then we create our blocks, that's our material. So continental crust, ocean crust, and mantle. Then we create our node sets uh, using the same, similar with what we do in our other examples. We create groups, create the node set from the group. So we have a fault co-seismic portion the co-seismic edge, then we do the top of the slab, do the top of the slab edge, do the bottom of the slab, bottom of the slab edge, um, ground surface, the boundaries on the west, east, and bottom. And those are reserved for future use, our side sets, and then we export the mesh. So let's bring in our qubit window and we'll run the, these portions. So let's switch over to the Python interpreter. Let's bring in, there we, let's copy lines here. So let's do the geometry. Uh, Put in the curves. Oops. Copy too much. We don't need the qubit setup. So, oops, too far. Let's start, let's do it a little more piecemeal then. So there we are down to line 95. So there's our topography bathymetry curve. There's our top of the slab. bottom of the slab. That's the bottom of the slab. Oh, we need to do the bottom edge. 
We'll do the boundaries as well. That brings us up to there. So there's our box. And we'll split this hers here. That splits. You can see some of the colors change here, and we split some of those curves. And we'll finish the geometry. Boom. So we, you saw briefly there, we had all of the, there we go. So we had multiple volumes and then we stitched everything together to create a single volume. Uh, so this is our sheet body, volume four. And we've got continental crust, oceanic crust. These are our surfaces and mantle. All right. Now let's generate our mesh. Okay, now you can see our mesh there. That's very similar to our G mesh. And we'll mark our materials. Now we have our blocks, continental crust, oceanic crusts, and mantle. And we'll create our node sets. Down here the node sets, and we've got our ground surface boundary west. It's a little hard to see, but those points are marked. East crust, east mantle, bottom boundary, post seismic. There you can stands out a little better. Top of the slab, bottom of the slab, and our edges. So that's our mesh, our triangular mesh. Uh, built using Qubit. Looks very similar to our mesh from GMesh. And uh, in the example, we're actually going to use just the GMesh case. Again, we're looking at example subduction 2D. We're going to do steps two and three. The files in the directory, example subduction 2D, we have a readme. We have our parameter files that these use the, the mesh from GMesh. We have our Python script that generates the mesh using GMesh, a different Python script using qubit. The .msh files are the final files generated by GMesh. Qubit will generate Exodus 2 files that end in .exo. We have spatial database files that end in .spatialdb and then uh, the output directory will be created automatically when we run the simulations. Okay, let's focus on step two. We're going to create creep on the top and bottom of the slab. In the co-seismic portion, we will have a creep rate of zero. Um, and then on the sort of down dip extension uh, that's along the top of the slab, we have right lateral. So that means it's negative creep rate of eight centimeters per year. On the bottom, we have left lateral. Left lateral in pilot is, uh, sense of slip is positive in pilot. So uh, the creep rate will be eight centimeters per year. So we'll have the slab moving down to the, the left at eight centimeters per year. Um, and, uh, but it'll be locked up here um, near the top of the trench or top of the slab as you approach the trench. On the lateral sides and bottom, we'll have displacement boundary conditions. We will not constrain this top portion of the oceanic crust. So translating that into physics, we have a fault. So we have both a displacement Lagrange multiplier in our solution field. We're solving uh, quasi-static elasticity 
we have ux equals zero on our negative and positive x boundaries, uy equals zero on our bottom boundary, and then we'll be specifying the slip rate on our faults. And the slip will be given as the slip rate times time on the faults. So just the integral of the slip rate. So in our parameter file, because we have our solution field with displacement Lagrange multiplier, we need to set what that is. We said it's quadratorial over one. Our basis order will be one. Uh, we're just going to use those default values. We are going to do um, 150 years of assimilation with that slip rate. So our initial time step is five years. We'll start at minus five years. So our, advan our first solve will be advancing from minus five years to zero. So our solution first solution output will be at zero. And then our end time will be 150 years. So that'll give us uh, 30 time steps. For our solving our elasticity equation, we're gonna have three materials, continental crust, ocean crust, and mantle. For our continental crust, we give it the description. Our label value is one that corresponds to the physical group in their GMesh file. We're going to specify the parameters of the continental crust in a spatial database, mat uh, crust, and we'll take a look at that. Uh, we're going to skip output. We'll skip one value between uh, output of the state variables over for the material. Our material properties are going to be uniform, so we're going to give uh, the auxiliary fields of a basis order zero, and then the uh, bulk modulus and shear modulus also have a basis order of zero. Um, they're rheology auxiliary subfields. Boundary conditions are relatively straightforward. With zero displacement boundary conditions, we can use the zero dB spatial database. Uh, we tell it uh, on for the x positive, x negative boundaries. We want to constrain the x degree of freedom. That's degree of freedom zero. In our GMesh file, that's physical tag group 13 with boundary east mantle. On the faults, we have two faults. So we need to create a ray, one for the top of the slab, one for the bottom of the slab. We give them appropriate names. We'll show here the, the, the top of the slab. We have the label that corresponds to the name of the physical group, its tag value, but we also have a buried edge. So we give the edge value, edge name, edge value. We're going to output slip and the traction change. We are going to, with a constant slip rate, we change the slip time function from a step function to kinematic source constant rate. That's what we use for the rupture. We're going to give it use a simple spatial database because we have a varying uh, distribution of creep rate along the fault. And so it's going to be in fault slab top creep. We do a query type linear so that we're going to do a linear interpolation along uh, the top of the top of the slab. So our input files are going to be the final mesh they're created in GMesh, pilot app.cfg. That's our common to all of the steps, including step one, step two, uh, specific parameters, and step zero two underscore inner seismic. We have our material properties. And I didn't list here um, the spatial database. So let's look at um, these input files. We'll start with the pilot app file that's common to all the parameter, all the simulations in this directory. We have our metadata that sort of specifies the features of the example. We have our journal information that's controlling what information is written to the screen. We're using GMesh, so our reader is the mesh IOPetsy. We give the name of the file. Coordinate system spatial dimension is two. And uh, we're going to, all the examples you have a fault in them, so we're just using set the solution field to be solution displacement Lagrange. And we have output on the domain as well as the ground surface. The ground surface is output solution boundary because it's not the full domain. For the domain, we're going to skip every other time step in the output. We will not skip all the any time steps to the output of the ground surface. 
the ground surface is labeled, uh, the name of the physical group is ground surf. Its physical tag is 10. We have our three materials as we showed going through our slides. So here's our materials. We have continental crust, um, spatial database, again, skipping values in the output, basis order zero because we have uniform properties, oceanic crust, mantle, very similar. So those are all uh, the material properties. We didn't include the boundary conditions because those change a little bit. We said that there was, um, and we didn't say what faults we were using because that changes. We go to step two, put in all the rest of the remain of the uh, metadata. This works with pilot version between four and five. Output, specify the names of the output files. We'll start with zero to step zero two underscore inner seismic. We're going to do our time stepping, as I mentioned before, initial time step five years, start at minus five years, go 100, total 150 years. Here's where we put our interfaces. Uh, this is just the matches what we had in um, the slides. Now for the bottom of the slab, uh, because we have uniform slip uh, creep rate, we give it, uh, we just use a uniform spatial database Values are initiation time, slip rate left lateral, slip rate opening. We have plus eight centimeters per year in the left lateral direction. Uh, boundary conditions, zero displacements. On the bottom, we constrain the y degree of freedom. On the x boundaries, we constrain the x degree of freedom. Names match what we had in our GMesh file. Notice here we're not constraining the entire east boundary, just the portion that's in the mantle. It has this physical group name and tag. Okay, so now let's go into the spatial database files. Here's the creep file. So this is a little bit more complicated. We have the slip rate in the left lateral direction, slip rate in the opening direction, initiation time. We give our units. We're gonna specify the values at four locations. We'll have um, a transition between zero and our creep rate of eight centimeters per year. That's right lateral. Um, that's why it's a minus sign. And then we just put in uh, these as a function of depth. Uh, notice that we don't have to give coordinates along the slab. If we just have a variation with depth, we uh, we can just put them in as a function of depth. The values will be projected onto this vertical line uh, where we need these uh, creep rate values. And so we have from you know something way up high, just arbitrary 99 kilometers makes it easy. We could have said plus five kilometers, anything that's above the highest point where we need the creep rate. And then down to minus 60, we're going to have a creep rate of zero from minus y equals minus 60 to y equals minus 75, linear transition from zero to eight centimeters per year. And then I put a value down, you know, well below the bottom of our model. It doesn't matter as long as it's below the bottom of the, of where the bottom of the slab, uh, just, you know, extend basically as far as we want down to my, uh, eight centimeters. So uniform below minus 75, linear transition up to minus 60, and then completely locked above that. Uh, relative initiation time zero. So it's just going to all start at zero, no rate opening. Let's look at our continental crust. So Matt's continental crust. Here we're just going to do one location, uniform internal properties, data dimension of zero. I should go back to the top. We had a data dimension of one because our data was specified along a line. We had four locations. We were in two dimensions. Um, so continental crust spatial database, just a single value. Coordinates don't matter. We always just, if we have a single value, we tend to put it at zero, zero. And then here's our 
you can see density vs and vp for the continental crust and we have very similar values for oceanic crust and the mantle um, so some slight variation in the properties all right we can go ahead and run our example so we run the example by running pileth step zero two inner seismic Zero two inner seismic. Let's make that a little bigger. So it's running, it's going to run through 30 solves, gets a total of 31 uh, time step index. You know, notice it, it found that it would, didn't do anything at time step 31. We have output and uh, Output directory for step zero one as well as step zero two. We want to visualize this, so we'll use the pilot viz tool. So our, we're going to visualize the domain. We're going to warp the grid and the component we're going to visualize is the x component. Oops, it did not copy the underscore there. What did we mess up? Um, uh, but uh, yeah, I didn't copy the underscores. There we go. Got a little issue here with the the labels as I switch screens. Here we're going to advance forward in time. You can see the boundary move. Let's exaggerate things by quite a bit more. Go back to the beginning. You can see the slab moving to the left and down. You'll notice it's locked top of the slab. Well, the inner top of the slab is locked here. It gets pulled down. And with our boundary condition over here, we are able to uh, allow the oceanic crust to just slide along. And you'll see that we're getting uh, some deformation down here below uh, the bottom of the slab. Deformation uh, along here where we have sort of a non-planar geometry. And then you can see how it uh, we're getting pulling down the continental crust near the trench. That's the X displacement. Let's do the Y displacement. And we'll see uh, a little more. There we go. Oops. Come back here. This is that exaggeration. So here you can better see the pattern of the uplift and subsidence, subsidence near the trench, uplift uh, further inland. There's our deformation field. All right. So that's step two, where we were just having the uh, interseismic creep. So now we want to 
make it a little more complicated, we're going to add in both co-seismic slip at, uh, t equals uh, 150 years in the upper portion, and then we'll keep the creep uh, on the other portions, the same, same boundary conditions as we had before. So our physics solution is the same, materials are the same, boundary conditions are the same. The fault now is a little different. We have uh, earthquake ruptures. We're going to do creep as well as an earthquake on the top of the slab. Our creep, uh, we give an origin time of zero. That's the default uh, for our earthquake. We're going to do it at 150 years. We will use, uh, for the earthquake, we're going to do the co-seismic slip distribution, linear variation and slip, and we're going to keep our same creep variation that we had in step two. So parameter files are, again, gmesh, final mesh, pilot app, step zero, 03 earthquake cycle. We had our spatial distribution of creep as well as our material properties. And so let's look at the uh, step three file. So pull that over. Bring this. Let's look at step three earthquake cycle. Scroll back to the top. It's very similar metadata to what we had before. Change the name of the output. Now we're going to go 300 years because we had the uh, earthquake in the middle at 150 years this time. Top of the slab, origin time for our earthquake is at 150 years. There's our co-seismic slip uh, set here using a spatial database, creep using another spatial database. Notice that we're doing earthquake ruptures creep down there, earthquake ruptures earthquake up there. Bottom of the slab looks the same as it did for um, step zero two. Again, um, just to be clear, the default is a kinematic source step, but we're going to be able to explicitly set that here. We would have to do this, but this just makes it clear that on the creeping portion, we're using a constant rate where you can use a step function for the earthquake rupture itself. So uh, boundary conditions are the same as what we had before. Let's look at the fault coast seismic spatial database. Uh, as before, we're just going to do as a function of depth, so that way we don't have to worry about uh, matching up precisely what the um, coordinates are along the interface in terms of x and y. We're going to take uh, the slip distribution from Gavin Hayes' finite fault model from back in 2011. Uh, so it just has values here um, in terms of uh, shallow uh, portion is, uh, and I believe these are in centimeters. So it's 11 meters, goes up to 32, 30, 19, uh, almost 20 meters, and then back down. Um, so slightly simplified version, um, but uh, gives us a, a interesting... Interesting depth variation in the slip. Uh, and you'll notice it's similar to what we had before. Uh, we extend the values well above uh, sea level just to have a value where we need to deal with topography. And then bottom of the domain, uh, go down to, you know, minus 999 uh, in terms of kilometers, uh, value of zero. So here we're going to add a depth of... 55, or sorry, y equals minus 55. That's where we transition uh, down to a zero slip in the co-seismic slip. So let's run step three. But it'll take a little bit longer. We're going to go out. There we go, 61 time steps. So let's visualize this. 
instead of inner seismic, we have step zero three underscore earthquake cycle domain. We'll again do the X component. We're going to warp the grid. It's explicitly the exaggeration of 5,000. So zoom in. Okay, we'll do time stepping here. So we see our slab moving. 10, 20, 130, 140, you should see our earthquake. There's our earthquake, complicated slip, exaggerated by a factor of 5,000, pretty extreme. And then the slab keeps going down. So here we have a short section that remained locked uh, right at the, sort of within the transition zone. Makes things a little more complicated, going backwards in time. Uh, complicated deformation. You know, when we prescribe the slip, we could have uh, had our slip transition here down to just perfectly match um, our creep rate. So it would release all of that uh, stress that gets built up. Um, but you can see what the sort of the complex deformation that happens when we used a realistic, relatively realistic distribution of slip. And that completes uh, this example of prescribed slip. We covered multiple faults, time-dependent deformation associated with uh, the having creep as well as combining earthquake ruptures to give a complicated slip distribution and deformation uh, with time and multiple time steps.